Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has won a commitment from Palestinian factions in the occupied Gaza Strip to maintain a truce with Israel that has been hit by a flare-up in violence. Abbas sealed the pledge in talks with leaders of 14 groups including Hamas and Islamic Jihad. But the group said they were committed to the calm as long as Israel did the same, threatening to respond to any Israeli attacks. A Hamas spokesperson said the de facto truce is in danger of collapse due to recent Israeli attacks. Meanwhile, Israel and the Palestinians said they made progress towards coordinating security steps for the pullout in talks yesterday, following weeks of discord over how to bar activists from taking over Gaza and staging attacks after the withdrawal. Israeli Defense Minister Shaul Mofaz and Palestinian Interior Minister Nasser Youssef reached the deal in talks in Tel Aviv. Palestinian Minister of Civil Affairs Mohammed Dahlan said Israel is reluctant to coordinate the pullout with the Palestinian Authority. But Mark Regev, an Israeli Foreign Ministry spokesman, said Israel was willing to coordinate this engagement with the Palestinians. Israel is open to coordinate this engagement with the Palestinian Authority. It's in our interest, it's in their interest, that the redeployment out of Gaza happens smoothly, quietly, without violence. Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon has cleared the last major legal hurdle to his pullout from the Gaza Strip in mid-August. Israel's highest court rejected a bid by Jewish settlers to overturn legislation underpinning the Gaza pullout. An 11-judge high court panel left largely intact a parliamentarily, parliamentary approved compensation package for 9,000 settlers slated for evacuation. A settler leader, however, said they would continue with their campaign against the withdrawal. Settlers had filed 12 petitions calling for the disengagement law to be invalidated or significantly rewritten. It was the latest in a series of attempts by settlers and their far-right supporters to derail Sharon's plan to remove all 21 settlements in the Gaza Strip and four enclaves in the West Bank. The ruling followed the release of an opinion poll last night showing Israeli public support for the withdrawal falling to a low point with less than half of the population now in favor. Clashes, meanwhile, erupted in the West Bank village of Selfit during a demonstration against construction of the separation wall. Israeli soldiers dispersed the crowd demonstrating near the construction site adjacent to the Jewish settlement of Ariel. Palestinian villagers and peace activists clashed with Israeli troops at the site and were then dispersed by tear gas canisters. The army also detained some of the protesters and declared the area a closed military zone. Ambulances evacuated three protesters and a soldier. A European Union delegation headed by its foreign policy chief Javier Solana and British Foreign Minister Jack Straw met Iraqi leaders in Baghdad to discuss a donor conference that will be held later this month. At a joint briefing after the talks, Iraqi President Jalal Talbani said the delegation was visiting to pave the way for the conference on Iraq due to be held in Brussels. More than 80 countries are attending the EU-US conference, which will take place on June 22nd. The gathering will examine how donations can be better coordinated and ways to cut lawlessness. Straw said he thought that although opinion in Europe had been divided over the Iraq war, the European Union was now united in its commitment to the new democratic Iraq. Yes, uh, the Iraq war did uh, divide uh, Europe, but as Jean has so generously said, now there is a new spirit around to put the past behind us uh, to work for this new future for Iraq in tangible ways and with the great help of our friends Xavier Solana and Berita Ferrero Waldner uh, to not just talk about the EU's commitment, uh, but to produce a real commitment from the European Union for the benefit of the people of Iraq. The International Atomic Energy Agency's Board of Governors begins its quarterly meeting today with the, aim, with the main issue of the third term for the agency's head, Mohamed al-Baradai. 
Though the United States generally opposes more than two terms for the position, U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice will meet in Washington with Al-Baradoi to discuss non-proliferation and the IAEA. During a visit by the German Foreign Minister Joschke Fischer, Rice also emphasized nuclear talks with Iran. Germany has been closely involved in non-proliferation talks with Iran over concerns that Tehran could potentially weaponize nuclear technology originally intended for electric power generation. How Iran uh, would be handled is an important issue. Also, uh, there have been some very interesting ideas about how to strengthen the non-proliferation treaty. The president had a number of them in his NDU speech last year. Um, Dr. Albaradai has had some ideas too. So uh, we will see uh, where we come out after those discussions. But um, I'd, I'd like to say that we have, of course, had good relations with him. And uh, the United States uh, looks, I look forward uh, on behalf of the United States to continuing our discussions with him tomorrow. Iraqi citizens are suffering from very difficult living conditions, including unemployment and shortage in basic services, amidst the instability that the country is going through. Ordinary Iraqis are expressing their dissatisfaction towards the situation and call on the government to do what is necessary to improve it. The Iraqi people have a lot of concerns on their minds. They, and especially the young men, suffer from unemployment, which has become a fact of life. Many are forced to take jobs that do not necessarily suit their educational qualifications. I am a high school graduate, and now my profession is to transport people and goods in this cart. I have not received any unemployment benefits. How am I supposed to provide for my family? We have to pay rent. Where is the government? And why aren't they helping us? In this coffee shop, the time has stopped. Time does not have any value for these people, so they try to kill it by playing different games, drinking tea and smoking hookahs. They are playing backgammon, hoping that luck will find its way to Iraq, whose people are under a heavy burden. These men have chosen to spend their time like this because many doors have been closed in their faces. They hope that some of these doors will open one day. Until this day comes, the message they want to send to the Iraqi government is when will the situation change. Iraqis have waited a long time, hoping this dim living situation will change. But now the children are being victimized, even before they reach the age of 10. There are more than 100,000 children who work, like Harem and Murtada. They are deprived of all the rights the rest of the children in the world enjoy. They are forced to work with shovels and jackhammers to support their afflicted families. This is not the only problem the Iraqis have. Housing shortages can be found throughout the country. Families are forced to live in government housing, and others are forced to pay large sums of money for a very simple home. Most people are looking for housing, but everything is very expensive. How can we afford such a thing? We have children. We need a place to live, but we can't find anything affordable. Iraqis have also been suffering from power shortages for a long time. This particularly affects small business owners whose work depends on electricity. When the power is cut, it takes four to five hours to come back. All our work depends on power. We can't even use power generators because we have gasoline shortages. Iraqi citizens have a long list of basic necessities. The only thing they can't think of is a day when all these problems are over. Hussein Abdel Wahab, Abu Dhabi TV, Baghdad. Haifa, 12 people were lightly injured today when police raided a house slated for demolition. 
Some 300 police officers were involved in the operation to expel the Arab-Israeli residents of the home who had been barricaded inside since yesterday. Knesset member Jamal Zahalka was at the protest and was hospitalized after feeling ill. Some witnesses claim that the police struck the Arab Knesset member, but police insist that minimum force was used throughout the protest. The officers moved in after members of the Abu Shkar family refused to leave the house and threatened to blow themselves up using gas tanks. Protesters clashed with police, exchanging blows prior to the expulsion of the family. Fifteen of the protesters were arrested. The mayor's office says the house was built illegally in an area designated as an industrial zone. On to other news now. Even the most serious issues, such as the disengagement process, have their lighter side, as we see in this story coming out of Gaza. It seems that a plastic surgeon from a Gush Katif settlement carried out an operation upside down. This in protest of the planned evacuation of his settlement and others from the Gaza Strip. Suspended above his patient, Dr. Sodi Namir removed pigmentation from his patient's back in this strange manner to protest what he called Israel's upside down policies. At the time where we have a population of people that are loyal to their tradition, to their land, to their people themselves, and they're being uh, ostracized and being uh, evoked from their homes from their houses, from their property, for absolutely no injustice whatsoever. And the Arabs and their terror are left to spread all over the place with support of Hamas and other terrorist groups to their free discretion. Why is it shocking and surprising to see a surgeon standing on his head removing a lesion? And it's not shocking for the world to see a whole country relate to terror completely in the reverse manner and an upside down fashion. A group of anti disengagement activists from the United States has arrived in the country. The group, organized by New York Sen State Senator Dove Hyken, traveled to Gaza in solidarity with the Jewish settlers set to be evacuated from the area. <laughs> People here, many of them, have come here to the airport and are going straight to Gush Katif to spend a few days there with the people. They have okay. spent their money, they have spent their money, they are not going to fancy hotels, they care deeply about the land of Israel and the people of Israel. And we love Israel. And for those who are going to ask me in a few minutes, what right do we have to be here, let me answer that question. I'm sure you asked the same question when reform rabbis came to Israel to get involved in the internal affairs of the Knesset on issues like Mi Yehudi and other issues, or others who come here and they feel and they care and get involved. The land of Israel does not belong only to a select group of people. It belongs to the Jewish people. And we're here to show our Jewish friends that we stand with them against this dastardly... Bravo! Bravo! This is a humanitarian issue, this is a civil rights issue, and most of all, we stand here in solidarity with them to let them know that we are with them in their time of need. Secretary General Said Hassan Nasrallah urged his supporters to vote for all candidates on an electoral ticket backed by MP Oli Jumlat and called on all Lebanese to put the past behind and turn a new political page based on dialogue. Nasrallah told a rally in the southern Beirut suburb of Erwais in the presence of candidates on the Mount Lebanon unity ticket for the hotly contested Babda Ali constituency, partisans and supporters should not slash any candidates names from the slate, which includes former war foes from the Falange party and Samir Jaja's Lebanese forces. He said Hezbollah will open a new political page and engage with all political factions without exception he said the group nominated its candidate Ali Ammar on the list because its members are committed to national unity, reform, the Ta'if Accord, which became Lebanon's post-war constitution, and the protection of the resistance. In a surprise move, Nasrallah adopted the assassinated President Bashir Jamail's motto of 10,452 square kilometers in reference to Lebanon's size. But he stressed that included all the Shiba farms occupied by Israel in seven villages that were annexed to Palestine before Israel was founded in 1948. 
His comments reaffirmed Hezbollah's commitment to continue fighting Israel's occupation despite mounting UN and US pressure to disarm under Security Council Resolution 1559. Nasrallah accused the U.S. and Israel of seeking to pressure Lebanon's new parliament into accepting long-standing demands and said the assembly will have a, quote, dangerous mission. Hezbollah's leader warned against what he described as U.S. and Israeli plans to sow discord and schism in the region and in Lebanon, citing American meetings with army command. Hezbollah has said its sweeping win in southern Lebanon elections was a big blow to U.S. policy toward the country and would stop any moves to disarm its fighters. The group's deputy chief, Sheikh Naim Qasim, left the door open on whether the party would join a new government for the first time after the staggered elections. The list of candidates nominated by Hezbollah and Amal grabbed all 23 seats in a landslide victory in the south last Sunday. The general elections, which started in Beirut on May 29th, continue in central and eastern Lebanon on June 12th, before wrapping up in the north on June 19th. Anti-Syrian opposition factions are set to win majority in the 128-member assembly, but groups that had been allied to Damascus, like Hezbollah, are expected to have substantial representation. Hezbollah played a key role in forcing Israel to end the 22-year occupation of southern Lebanon and withdraw its troops. The United States, which lists Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, repeated its demand the group be disarmed after the vote. Hezbollah hopes to have 14 members elected to parliament this term, compared to 12 in the outgoing assembly. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has dispatched the key envoy to talk to Syrian leaders about Lebanon, but the precise purpose of the visit is still unclear. Norwegian Tedrod Larsen, a UN Special Envoy, was due to arrive in Damascus on Sunday for a meeting with Syrian President Bashar Assad. His mission coincided with U.S. calls for the Security Council to expand the probe of the assassination of Prime Minister Hariri to include slain journalist Samir Kassir. The U.S. retracted its demand, but Washington and Paris are helping in the murder investigation of the prominent opposition journalist. UN spokesman Stefan Dujaric refused to say why Anand sent Larson to Damascus or what his message would be, saying as a matter of courtesy, President Assad should be the first person to know. His trip, diplomats said, grew out of a general desire by France and the United States to keep the pressure on Damascus to fully implement a UN Security Council resolution intended to prevent Syria from interfering in Lebanon. Paris and Washington drafted the resolution, adopted by the 15-nation council adopted last September. It demanded that Syria withdraw its military and intelligence forces from Lebanon, which Damascus did last month. But it also demanded Syria not interfere in Lebanese elections and that all militia on Lebanese soil be disarmed. A UN verification team had reported last month that all Syrian troops had been withdrawn, but it could not say whether all intelligence agents had pulled out. France initially thought of sending back the verification team to look for Syrian agents, but UN officials were unenthusiastic, fearing such a repeat mission would only result in a second inconclusive report. Pressure grew after anti-Syrian columnist Samir Qasir was assassinated last week in a Beirut bombing. That prompted the United States to suggest an ongoing international investigation into the assassination of Lebanese Prime Minister Rafik al-Hariri, killed on February 14th, be expanded to include a probe into Qasir's death. But extending the Hariri inquiry would have required a new Security Council resolution. And Washington quietly shelled the idea after the chief investigator, German Detlev Melis, objected and the Beirut government invited in a team of FBI agents and French police to assist in the probe. In place of a new resolution, the council at U.S. Urgent approved on Tuesday a statement denouncing the Kassir killing and reiterating the importance of all foreign forces withdrawing from Lebanon. And Patterson, the acting U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, told reporters there was fear it might detract from the Hariri probe, although the same results could be achieved, quote, through other ways, through technical assistance from foreign governments and the United Nations. While UN officials said Rod Larson's strategy was still being worked out, Patterson said the very fact he was going to Damascus showed you and concern. She said an FBI team has been in Lebanon for some days.
The International Court of Justice started an official investigation into the war crimes that were allegedly committed in the Darfur region of Western Sudan in response to a request made by the United Nations Security Council. News reports indicate that tens of thousands of people were killed in Darfur since the armed conflict started in 2003. In response to a request by the United Nations Security Council, the International Court of Justice started an official investigation into crimes allegedly committed in Darfur, Western Sudan. The International Court in The Hague said that the investigation will be neutral and independent and will focus on individuals that are the most responsible for the crimes that took place in Darfur. We will conduct an investigation, and we will not depend on the results of previous investigations. Our investigation will be independent, but it will take a long time until we can reach the results of this investigation, which came in response to a request from the UN Security Council. The Commission decided to transfer the Darfur file to the International Court of Justice so it can investigate the situation there. The investigation was initiated by the consent of the United Nations Security Council according to a vote that was taken in March 2005 calling for the transfer of the Darfur file to the International Court of Justice. This is the first investigation initiated by the International Court based on a request made by the Security Council. The United States opposed the International Court of Justice when it was established in 2002, but now it has agreed that this court should look into the crimes that were committed in Darfur. The Sudanese government, which is supposed to resume negotiations with the rebels on Friday in the Nigerian capital of Abuja, expressed dissatisfaction with the efforts being made for an investigation instead of focusing focusing on reaching a ceasefire agreement in Darfur. This would enable the refugees to feel safe and would enable human rescue missions to reach approximately 2 million refugees. President of the Southern States Council, Dr. Iyad Dai, confirmed that different lifestyles and religious tolerance does exist between the people of Sudan. In his meeting with the American dignitaries, he pointed out the negative propaganda that the Western media played in depicting the problems of Darfur and the South as a religious and racial problem in an attempt to isolate Sudan from its regional and international spectrum. The allegation of the international community that Sudan violated human rights and Darfur will only deepen interior problems of the Sudanese people. Dr. Dai affirmed that the Americans understand the conditions that Sudan is facing and were reassured that the peace process will be a turning point in the Sudanese foreign relations. National and human conditions are improving on a large scale in the Darfur region. Such improvements can be witnessed by the widespread return of refugees to their territories. 3,000 families have returned to the district of Baida in the town of Habalia in western state of Darfur. Darfur is working diligently to encourage the voluntary return of refugees. Security-wise, the state is witnessing total stability and life is returning to normal. Suleiman Abdullah, the governor of West Darfur, confirmed that the government is meeting its responsibilities and obligations by providing the returned refugees with any humane assistance they might need to guarantee their stability and welfare. The governor took a first-hand look at construction and reconstruction construction projects as he toured the areas of Baida and Konhiraza. He addressed the refugees while assuring them that there is enough food and shelter for everyone and that they should be ready for a good harvest season. The government is represented by its own governor and its security systems and all the concerning parties will work hard in providing the Darfur people with the assistance needed for a safe return to their towns. The leadership of the local administration for the refugees and settlers announced that it will continue to work hard in bringing back the security and social stability to the state of Darfur. 
In his visit to Sudan, Muslim missionary Yusuf Islam visited the Islamic University of Om Derman. As he toured the university, he listened to comprehensive explanations about the university from its president, Professor Muhammad Uthman Saleh. Mr. Islam was impressed by what the university has to offer, pointing out his own experience in Islamic missions in a number of countries. We hope for educational cooperation between the two sides, and the president of the university shared his views on such a partnership. In another related development, Islamist Yusuf Islam visited the Child Center in Maigoma and the Head Start Children's Center in Taiba in the town of Jabal al Aulia. The officials of the center gave Mr. Islam an orientation and a comprehensive explanation of the role that these centers play in preparing and arming the children with the knowledge and experience necessary for sustaining careers in the mechanical, electronical and and agricultural fields. Iran on Wednesday crushed Bahrain 1 0 to become the second team to qualify for the next year's World Cup finals in Germany. Iran's only needed, Iran only needed a point to book the ticket for the World Cup finals, but defender Mohamed Nostrati scored a firm header two minutes into the second half. The leader of the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and President Mohammad Khatami, who was among spectators, have separately sent messages of Congratulations over the remarkable victory. Here is a no common report on the great national event. More games next summer in Germany, and that is a big gift for all Iranians who are well prepared to go to raptures again. With the election day for the top executive post just around the corner, the campaign is taking a new momentum as the propaganda clips for the candidates directed by outstanding Iranian film directors will be aired on the new Iranian new network, news network as of Thursday. As is scheduled, the eight contenders are attending live in discussion panels on Channel 2. The Iranian state TV has announced readiness to broadcast face-to-face -face debates of the presidential hopefuls, though some of them are reluctant to attend. Incoming reports indicate that Iranians residing abroad are showing more tendency to go to the presidential polls as a means to prove their favor for their, for their homeland. And here follows the remarks made, by, made on Wednesday by the eight aspiring candidates running for president. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Observing the principle of national dignity, expedience, and relying on the nation, we can confront outside threats. Mohamed Baghir Alibaf, the issue of hijab should not be politicized. The administration of justice is more important. Akbar Hashimir Sanjani, any government coming into power should respect the viewpoints of the clergy who have played a leading role throughout the Iranian history. Mehdi Kagubi, defending the rights of the nation, freedom of thought, and enforcing the Constitution will be on my agenda. Ali Larijani, investments should be directed to production activities. Managers should cut down on formalities. Mohsen Mer Alizadeh, I'm in for serving the nation away from politi political struggles or tension. Mustafa Moin, the Iranian nation will never bow to an imposed democracy. My government will not tolerate any violation of civil rights. And Mohsen Rezaei, I have designed a pattern for reconstruction of the national economy. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedahl Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.